Okay, so hopefully you can see a uh, title slide, how to prepare for a no deal GDPR Brexit. Um, as I said, if you want to ask questions as we go through, feel free to use the chat. Um, if anybody joins, I get a ping in my ear. So if I look slightly distracted or uh, hesitate while I'm talking, it's probably because I'm letting somebody else uh, join the call. Um, but uh, um, yeah, otherwise use chat to ask questions um, or we'll pick them up at the end. So my name is Mark Gracie and I run Mark Gracie GDPR. Um, I support businesses with their GDPR compliance. Um, I do that primarily through a, a range of helpline services on a subscription, month by month subscription basis. Um, at the premium end, uh, you get uh, unlimited email and phone support, access to online resources and um, uh, hands on help. So I can take care of the um, difficult or maybe you find G tedious GDPR um, compliance aspects um, um, or uh, I can help you as you, you go along um, yourself. Um, I'll talk a bit more briefly about that towards the end. Um, my, my background is very much in a regulatory environment. Uh, I began working with data protection back in the uh, late 90s when the 1998 came, that Data Protection Act came into force. Uh, I was working at an internet service provider at that point um, and that was the beginning of a 15 plus year career in uh, reg regulation and compliance, uh, primarily in the internet industry and, and, and telecoms, but uh, with a, a, a strong uh, lead in data protection, data retention, and, and various other data related um, issues. Um, so today's session is about um, the end of the GD and sorry, the end of the Brexit uh, transition period, um, which the government's confirmed will be on the 31st of December of this year. Um, which means that from the 1st of January 2021, um, we will be um, completely outside of the EU. So we've, we've Brexited already in the sense that we are no longer part of the EU, but there's this, this being this transition in 2020, um, which um, allows um, for basically EU regulation and control um, to carry on through throughout 2020. I think some people were thinking it was going to be um, paused or delayed on the basis that um, uh, we've had to deal with coronavirus uh, this year. But um, the government's made it clear that from 1st of January next year, we will be out of the transition period and, and basically be on our own outside of, of the EU. So there are data protection connotations about that. And in fact, I'm beginning to get asked um, by quite a few people about the implications. Um, and so that's what this uh, webinar is about. Um, we're going to look at, uh, I'm just going to quickly go over the GDPR elements of restricted transfers and, and what that means, so setting setting the scene as it were, um, and then we'll look at what this has got to do with Brexit um, and also look at what this means in practice with some things for you to, to think about in terms of, of taking things forward depending on what kind of processing you're, you're doing. Um, and as I said, there's a QA and a at the end, but feel free to use the chat to ask questions as we uh, go through. So let's just have a, a recap on um, where non-EU data transfers comes into, in, into GDPR. Um, so I often use this slide, so apologies if you've seen it before, if you've been on um, any other webinars I've run, um, but it's a, a basically a summary of GDPR in, in one slide. Um, just to recap, we're talking about uh, data protection and GDPR, and that applies to the protection of personal data, so any data that identifies an individual. Um, and the rules um, or the principles of data protection set out what you can and can't do. Um, and uh, we haven't got time to go through all of this. Um, we have the lawful basis. Um, you have to have at least one of those applies to your processing at, at any time, depending on the, the purpose. The different purposes need to have different lawful bases. Um, individuals' rights, the rights of the data subjects, so the individual's data that you're processing. Um, and then there's the accountability principle, which is about proving that you are GDPR compliant. And that ranges from the use of tools and concepts like data protection by design and default and data protection impact assessments to making sure your staff understand data protection at a basic level. So there's training and policies and, and so forth. Um, and there's also a, a, a clear obligation to, to document your processing activities should you ever be asked to demonstrate that. Now, I've highlighted um, under the data protection principles, it's not officially a data protection principle as defined in GDPR, but it, it fits within the rules uh, sort of section. Um, and uh, that's about non-EU uh, processing. Um, and basically what that means is that um, and this is uh, covered in chapter five of the uh, GDPR, 
Um, it basically says if you're processing your data outside the EU, then you must have appropriate safeguards in place. Um, what those safeguards are will, will vary. Um, so there are adequacy decisions, which means the EU have declared that certain countries' data protection laws are equivalent or, or suitable to maintain EU um, compliance. So, for example, in that list there, um, in that top circle, there's um, Andorra and Argentina, Faroe Islands, Guernsey, Israel, New Zealand, Switzerland, etc. If you process your um, data in Argentina, for example, then you don't need to worry about any other safeguards because uh, the EU have declared that Argentina's data protection law is, is, is appropriate. Um, failing an adequacy decision, so if you need to process your data in a country like the United States or India or China where that those their laws haven't been declared as um, adequate, um, then there may be some other um, mechanisms in place or safeguards in place. Now, I've put a red line through EU US Privacy Shield because um, if uh, if you didn't know, and I know there's some people on the call that attended a, a talk, and I've got a slide just very quickly to summarize. Um, I did a talk earlier this week about the fact that the EU US Privacy Shield has actually been declared invalid. Um, and in reality, that's the only um, other safeguard that's in place. So in, in, for all intents and purposes, you can ignore that adequate safeguards in place bubble and, and the EU Privacy Shield. Um, because that doesn't exist anymore in terms of being appropriate. So no adequacy decision, then you've left with basically, um, if there's an exception, which is um, the bubble on the left, um, there's a number set out in GDPR um, that means that you don't need to have adequate safeguards because other exemptions exist. But the most common thing that most people will therefore be relying on if there is no adequacy decision um, is to uh, look at the use of some kind of contracts. Now, there are standard contract clauses or sometimes called SEC, um, abbreviated as SEC, um, or sometimes called model clauses, and there's also binding corporate rules. So binding corporate rules are for um, large organizations who have, um, uh, within a group of com companies, um, operates around the world, and if you're in the EU and you wish to pass, say, um, some personal data to be processed by your parent company or another part of the business in a non-EU uh, co company, uh, sorry, country, then you could make use of internal contractual clauses between the, say, the EU element of the business and the, and the say, the US element of the business um, or the Indian part of the business or, or whatever. Now, they, these binding corporate rules are purely internal. Uh, controls and they have to be approved by the uh, regulator, which for the UK is the Information Commission's Office or the ICO. Um, so not many people use these because there's a usually a, a, a month's um, an, a process you have to go through with the ICO in terms of them validating your binding corporate rules. But uh, there, they, there are some companies that do use that. So the default tends to fall down to the standard contract clauses. Um, and these are non-negotiable contract clauses set out in an EU regulation that essentially bind the um, receiver of the data, so the, the, where the data is being processed um, in a non-EU uh, country, um, to EU standards of data protection. And it also provides uh, an element of recourse for um, the uh, data subjects. So the key tools to look for in terms of safeguards are essentially adequacy decisions, so you're processing data in a country that um, has been declared having adequate data protection. And um, the other alternative is so you put in place these standard, standard contract clauses, or if, you're, if it's an internal transfer, then you could look at using binding corporate rules or BCR as they're abbreviated. Um, now where this fits into data protection in general, and just to clarify, there is, of course, a very wide definition of processing when it comes to uh, GDPR, um, and it's everything you do with your data. So it's not just the purpose for which you're processing the data or you've collected the data in the first place. Um, there are uh, processing also covers the storage, deletion, editing, the manipulating, the sharing of your data, and everything that you do with that data. So it's important to be mindful that when you're thinking about where in the world your data is being processed. If you're sticking it on a um, sticking the data in a cloud storage solution like Dropbox or or OneDrive, or you're using a, a CRM, a customer relationship management system like say HubSpot, or you're using Mailchimp for your email marketing, 
whilst you are doing the actual processing of the data, you're using their platform and because their platform is processing it for you or storing the data for you, they are processing as well. So they're considered data processors. And whilst there's controls around how you in engage with these data processors, so you have to be sure they're GDPR compliant and that you've got a contract in place, you also need to understand where in the world their data is being processed. And if it's being processed outside the EU, then you have to look up for one of these safeguards. So don't think of it just about the fact that you might be transferring your personal data to a marketing company that operates out of India and they do your marketing for you. It is that, but it also could be where you're storing or sharing your data through platforms and cloud-based services, um, et cetera. Um, and I'll come on to why this is relevant in a, in a sec, in a, in a sec um, sorry, relevant to Brexit in, in a, in a second. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So I just briefly wanted to summarize um, what's happened because of the Schrems 2 case, which has led to me striking out EU privacy shield on, uh, sorry, EU US privacy shield on that slide. Um, a couple of weeks ago, a, a European court declared that um, due to national surveillance programs in the US, uh, so national law in the US um, that uh, gives the government power to seize data without any particular controls, um, with no redress by the data subject, which could include European citizens' data, the court declared Privacy Shield invalid. Um, so the, the downside of that is if you're relying on a data transfer and you're relying on Privacy Shield for a EU US data transfer, you can no longer do that. Um, which really means the default then falls to these standard contract clauses, but there is now a question about whether they would themselves be valid if national law trumps um, what the uh, organisation is that's processing your data um, should or shouldn't do according to, na to national law. So for the same reasons the Privacy Shield have been, has been deemed invalid, the standard contract clauses are now in question as to whether it's appropriate to use standard contract clauses. Um, and uh, the court indicated that the data controller, so the organisation who is instigating the processing in a, in a non-EEA uh, country um, and the supervisory authorities should really assess the risk to the processing under the standard contract clauses by a US organisation. So um, the ICO updated their um, guidance uh, at the beginning of this week um, on this and they basically said you shouldn't be relying on Privacy Shield anymore. It is illegal to do so. Um, you might be able to rely on standard contract clauses, but you've got to carry out your um, a risk assessment to determine whether it's appropriate for you to use standard contract clauses. And the, and the downside is if you look at what Mailchimp, Google, HubSpot or, or whatever are saying about uh, EU to US data transfers, they're saying, don't worry that Privacy Shield's being made invalid because we use standard contract clauses. And they seem to have completely missed the point that the same reason Privacy Shield's invalid, standard contract clauses are potentially invalid anyway. Um, I'm not going to say any more about this. Um, it's a, a pretty big deal um, for pretty much everybody because we all use in one way or another a, a US-based cloud service um, to, to process some kind of data in some way. As I say, whether that's your email marketing platform or your, your CRM or, or just for storing spreadsheets in the cloud or, or whatever. Um, so this is not a problem that's going to go away and we're sort of kind of waiting to see what the guidance from the ICO um, will be in, in, a, in a more detailed sense than what they've said so far. If you want to catch up on what this all means, then uh, if you go to uh, markgracygdpr.co.uk, my website, and look in the blog section, there's a blog post there that includes a, a recording of the session I ran, um, I think it was on Tuesday. So anyway, that explains why I've crossed out US Privacy Shield as, a, a, as an appropriate lawful basis. Now, this is really, as a, so far, as I said, this is a background to GDPR and, and um, uh, what's called a restricted transfer or international transfer is the, uh, the term that the ICO use, um, which controls the processing of data outside the European economic area. So big question, what's this got to do with Brexit? Well, simply put, um, UK, when we finish the transition period, so from January next year, will be considered what's called a third country. So that means that processing data in the UK from the EU would be a restricted transfer. So all of those rules that I've just covered in a, in a summary of what GDPR says 
for example, in terms of US data processing or processing data in India or China or whatever, suddenly the UK falls within that category of, of countries that are not no longer part of the European economic area. Um, and, uh, and therefore, we need to look at what are the appropriate safeguards for EU to UK data flows. Um, and this also means that you will need to think about what this means for your organization with regards to how you're processing your data or the data that you process perhaps for clients, depending on whether it's coming from the EU, whether you're a UK only business, whether you're um, processing data in, in the States or, um, or whatever. Um, so this is, uh, you know, significantly um, a, a, an issue um, at the end of the transition period, but actually a lot of it will come down to whether there's a deal or a no deal in a, in a GDPR context. Um, so what I mean there is obviously there's lots of negotiations going on between the UK and the EU and um, the next slide's got some quotes from some statements that the uh, EU, uh, various EU organisations have, have put out about the processing of data in the UK when it's no longer part of the EU. Um, so in the UK we will have the UK GDPR, so for all intents and purposes GDPR will carry on being our data protection law although obviously in the future the UK government can do what it likes with data protection, but it would have to bear in mind um, what the expectations of our, our nearest probably uh, business partners and, and trade um, partners are, are likely to be, i.e. I, Europe. But we will have a UK GDPR, so we'll probably start talking about UK GDPR and EU GDPR, but for uh, certainly initially they will be exactly the same as what we're living under right now is GDPR. Um, and of course, we have the Data Protection Act 2018, which will continue to be a vehicle of controlling and implementing GDPR and dealing with some of the, um, the nuances in what you can and can't tweak within national law with regards to what GDPR says. But ultimately, when it comes to what the implications of Brexit mean for GDPR and data transfers and data flows um, is going to be about whether there's a deal or a no deal agreed between the EU and the UK. So if there is a deal, then we might find that we have an adequacy decision. There may be some controls around the one-stop shop um, and around the use of representatives. Now, apologies, I, I did mean to sort of highlight that on a previous slide. So when we were talking about the chapter five appropriate safeguards um, stuff, top left blue, blue box, um, as well as these controls about making sure there's a safeguard in place, um, there are obligations that if you process data of you, EU citizens, because you target EU citizens, but you're not in the EU, then you have to have somebody representing you um, on the ground, essentially in the EU, and they would call it an EU representative. And also the member states all benefit from what's called a one-stop shop. So that means that if um, an infringement happens in France and you're based in France, a lead authority is given to you as being probably the French regulator and they all operate on behalf of the nationalities in the member states of any data that's been breached or, or had an issue with. So there's a, a lead authority assigned. So that means that within Europe, you don't have to worry about whether you're, if you're dealing with French citizens, that you have to apply your national regulator and the French regulator is all treated as one. So that's what I mean by one stop shop. So apologies for missing that earlier. Um, so yeah, if there's a deal, we could get an adequacy decision. So that's the EU saying, yes, of course you can process data in the UK, it's all, all good. Um, or that there, there could be some um, more information about how we sit within this one-stop shop or whether we don't at all, um, and uh, whether we need an EU representative. However, if there's a no deal, there's potentially no adequacy decision, no outcome of deliberations about whether we can benefit from the one-stop shop, and no uh, and then potentially a need for EU representative. So at the moment we don't really know what the outcome is going to be. We're you know we're coming to it'll be August next week so uh, well this weekend so um, you know we're, we're only four months away from the end of the transition period and we're still waiting to find out and you know ultimately you might want to leave this till the last minute to dis decide because something could happen in in December and it's all become suddenly clearer and you don't need to worry about it but potentially if we go down the route of a no deal from a GDPR point of view then we 
you will need to change probably the way you work if you if you uh, engaging with EU citizens or you're processing EU citizens data on behalf of EU organizations and that's what the rest of this presentation is going to be about so um, in an ideal world we get a deal everything sorted nothing really changes but in case that doesn't happen you need to be prepared um, for possibly having to do a lot a lot of work towards the end of this year once we know that's for sure um, or maybe into the new year depending on what the ICO tell us to do um, and so uh, I'm going to co concentrate from now on looking at the no deal because that's where the big issues are, are going to arise. Now in terms of what the EU are saying so there was a, um, a, a parliament a European parliament uh, sort of um, declaration as part of the negotiations between the EU and the UK that talks about data protection and says that the EU um, council, the parliament, everybody who's making these decisions about whether we would have a deal from a GDPR point of view or not, um, need to consider a number of things that may bring into question whether UK data protection law is equivalent to EU data protection law. Now that may sound stupid because we have um, EU GDPR right now in transition and have done since it came into force in 2018, but it's not as complicated, I'm sorry, it's not as straightforward as that. So um, as this uh, statement from the Parliament says, there are elements in the Data Protection Act 2018 that provides exemptions for immigration purposes, which means that um, UK citizens benefit from better data protection than non-UK citizens, and therefore that is in con contradiction to the concept that actually EU data protection should travel with you no matter where you are in the, in the world. Um, and there is also um, an issue around the implementation of a data retention directive um, which impacts on um, electronic telecommunications data. Now my, my background's in internet and telecoms in, uh, industry and this was a big deal in, in the fact that um, the government can, the UK government can ask a UK telecoms operator to retain data for um, I think it's up to 10 years um, which they might not need for any purpose and this uh, the EU have made clear is, is very much outside the bounds of what the data retention directive actually originally intended so you know all things considered there's two very good reasons there the EU Parliament are saying that um, you might not want to give um, the UK an adequacy decision because whilst they are using and applying GDPR there are other elements of data protection law which um, the UK have tweaked in their um, to their benefit and not necessarily to the benefit of EU member states citizens data um, and then most recently so on the 9th of July so that parliamentary statement was from February from earlier this month um, the Commission produced a communication on the readiness at the end of the transition period between the European Union and the United Kingdom um, and uh, it sets out some of the challenges that are ahead but in terms of recommendations it basically has said that um, businesses need to uh, submit businesses in the member states so not UK in in the European economic um, area um, with the UK not included in that needs to prepare themselves for the possibility that there will not be an adequacy decision they're going to do everything they can to make sure that there there is or at least they consider the the potential and of course as that previous statement I was talking about said there's some issues about whether adequacy is actually going to happen or not. Um, so um, what they are hinting at is you might need to think about what the appropriate safeguards are in case that there's a, a, a no deal GDPR Brexit essentially at the end of the transition. So from, from an EU member state perspective, there's very much a, a potential that EU businesses that you may be working with might start asking you complicated questions around what you're going to do about ensuring GDPR compliance will you set aside any standard contract clauses and, and so forth. So let's let's look at what this actually means in, in practice um, and I've set out uh, four different scenarios depending on what kind of business you are in, in the UK um, and what kind of processing you're doing of EU citizens or, or on behalf of EU business uh, um, or even non-EU uh, or non-EEA, I should say, um, uh, uh, processing as well. So first of all, simple, if you're a UK business, operates solely in the UK, only processes the data of UK citizens, so don't, you don't have any 
um, engagement with non-UK citizens, nothing changes. Um, there is no real impact whether there's a deal or not um, because UK GDPR will apply, Data Protection Act 2018 will apply, you'll be answerable to the Information Commissioner's Office, um, carry on as you do today and as you have for the last couple of years. So if you're UK only, no engagement with the EU, no processing of EU citizens data, UK completely, then um, there's no real change. However, it gets a bit more interesting from, from here on in. If you're a UK business and you're targeting EU citizens, so you've got EU customers, so this is not you as a processor on behalf of an EU company, this is you doing a, delivering a service and your customers for that service are um, EU citizens. In the UK, you'll be governed by the Information Commissioner Office and UK GDPR and the Data Protection Act 2018. If you have offices within the European Economic Area, then your EU activities, so the processing of EU citizens' data, will be covered by your EU offices, essentially, um, and EU GDPR, so you'll be answerable to whichever um, lead authority, um, so that's the ICO in the UK, um, the lead authority in the country that you are um, domiciled in. So, for example, um, a lot of US businesses, it's a slightly obscure example, but a lot of US businesses are based in Dublin. So if you had an office in Dublin and you had an office in the UK and you were processing French customers' uh, data, you would be answerable for your data processing in the UK according to the ICO, but you'd also be answerable to the Irish Data Commissioner, uh, Data Commission, because you ha have a, 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 a um, uh, you have offices or a presence in in Ireland, essentially, even though it's French um, French uh, citizens you're dealing with. That means that for EU processing, your EU controls will be run out of your EU office, and you will benefit from that EU office from that one stop shop. So you don't have to worry about the E, um, you know, the, the the Irish regulator, the UK regulator, and the French regulator. If it's French citizens, you would just need to worry about the UK regulator if it's UK citizens based, um, although the ICO would probably pay attention if it was EU breaches as well, um, and the Irish regulator in in um, in for the fact that you're domiciled in, in the EU as well. Now, if you have no presence and no offices um, in the EU, but you're still processing EU citizens data, so we'll stick with the French customers you might have, um, EU GDPR still applies. UK GDPR still applies. Um, you'll be answerable to lead authorities in the countries in which you have um, uh, uh, caused an issue. Now, potentially, um, because it's a French, um, French citizens we were talking about in our example, you'll be answerable to the ICO in the UK, but you'll also be answerable to the French regulator um, in, in France for the uh, infringements of uh, the French citizens' data. Now, if you've got multi-member state um, issues, then it's possible you may be answerable to those other member states, uh, lead authorities or regulators as, as, as well. Um, and you also should look at what you're doing with your uh, documentation, your privacy policies, so that you update everything to reflect the fact that actually the regulatory regime will have changed. And so you'll need to update your privacy policies to explain how you're processing data, who you're answerable to and, and, and so forth. And, obviously remove any any references appropriately um, when you talk about EU legislation because you'll be bound by UK legislation as well so you'll need to uh, work out a, a set of wording to, to cover that scenario. So that's UK businesses based in the UK targeting EU customers with a variation depending on whether you're based in the EU as well so you've got offices in the EU or whether you don't have offices in the EU and, the, and in addition to being um, not party to the one-stop shop in the EU, um, there is also the fact that you will need to probably appoint a EU representative. So that's somebody who acts on your behalf for data protection measures to all of the EU regulators, um, and they have to be domiciled in the EU. So there are companies that um, people use um, already that exist because this applies to anybody else. So a US business targeting EU citizens, for example, has to have an EU representative 
um, and um, some of those may be in, in Ireland or they may be in France or, or wherever, depending on who you want to choose. So there is a, a, a potential there that you will not only be bound by different laws, depending on where the citizens are from and where, how you operate, but you may also need to have a EU representative and pay somebody to take on board your or act for you within the EU from a data protection point of view. And, and there are companies, as I say, that um, provide that as a service. Now, if you're a UK processor and you are processing on behalf of EU customers, so the controller for the, the, the data controller for the personal data is in the EU, but you are a data processor that they use for processing. So that could be you run a cloud-based service that say a French company uses, or you could be a UK processor that does marketing on behalf of uh, companies in France um, for, for, for um, whatever reason. But if you're seen as a data processor and they're seen as the data controller and they're based in the EU, your processing activities, because you're based in the UK, are governed by UK GDPR Data Protection Act 2018 and enforcement or answerable to the Information Commissioner's Office. Your clients will still be applying EU GDPR, which says that if you're processing data outside the European Economic Area, you need to apply appropriate safeguards. And of course, UK will be seen to be outside the European Economic Area. So if there is no adequacy decision, this comes down to you probably having to uh, agree to standard contract clauses. Now these aren't, as I said before, non-negotiable, so they literally are a cut and paste from an EU regulation into, into um, a contract, but that means you are likely to enter into new contract negotiations. And, and whilst the non-negotiable part of that contract, the standard contract clauses bits, is non-negotiable, so that has to be the same, Obviously, uh, com some companies top and tail it with other conditions and things as well. So you'll need to be mind mindful of that. Um, and again, you'll need to uh, make sure your privacy policies and everything are up to date and so you've got enough information to help the individual uh, controllers in from the EU in terms of understanding what you're doing and why it's lawful for them to, to use you. So if you're targeting EU citizens, that's the previous slide. If you um, you may need an EU representative if you don't have uh, um, offices or, or um, a presence in the, an EU country. Um, if you do have presence in the EU country, then you'll be answerable to the EU part of your processing activities in the EU. But if you're processing and seen as a data processor in the UK for EU controllers, so this is EU to UK data flow then your EU customers or the partners or whoever you're working with will need to consider the fact that the UK is now a restricted uh, transfer of, of data and therefore that they need to apply appropriate safeguards and ultimately that's going to come down to standard, standard contract clauses unless of course the EU say that there's an adequacy decision that they're willing to, uh, to uh, agree to. Um, and then finally, um, we mustn't forget that there is still a control for processing data outside the EU and um, that will be true for UK businesses as well. So if you're continuing to process data in China, India, the US or, or whatever, then you need to consider the implications of where that will sit within the UK. So again, because you're in the UK, you'll be bound by the UK GDPR Data Protection Act 2018 um, and um, enforcement by the Information Commissioner's Office. Um, the government have said that transfers to Europe, so if you're processing your data in Europe, so if you're a UK company and you've got a server or storage space or you're using an application that's run out of, of Dublin or, or some other um, European uh, member state, France, Germany, Spain, etc., then there won't be any restrictions. So we won't see from a UK law perspective that non-UK data protection processing in Europe is considered a restricted transfer. So there will be no restrictions. We will um, deem all European economic area countries as being adequate and therefore those processing and, and that transferring can, can carry on as it does today. Um, the UK will also probably, um, there's a strong indication that they will, recognise any EU adequacy decisions and uh, any other safeguards for non-EE data transfers. So if the EU says it's okay to process data in Argentina, Israel, New Zealand, etc., then it will be also okay for you from the UK to process your data in those countries as well. So if there's an adequacy decision from EU, the UK will recognize those. If there are other controls or safeguards put in place for non-EEA data transfers, 
then the UK will probably recognise us as well. That also, of course, brings into question what UK will do with the uh, fact that Privacy Shield has now been um, uh, essentially uh, deemed invalid um, and is now illegal um, to, to use. Um, so uh, whatever comes out of that from an EU perspective will probably apply to the UK as well. Unless for whatever reason the UK decide to do as part of a trade deal a UK-US equivalent of Privacy Shield, in which case that may bring into question um, some adequacy issues, but um, it's all, all up in the air in that, in that regard. But uh, essentially, you'll be able to carry on processing data in the EU without any restricted transfers. If you're processing data outside the European Economic Area and outside the UK, then it will fit in with whatever EU are saying. Um, unless the UK come up with its own own plan, but there's no indication of that at the moment. Um, and again, you'll need to update your privacy policies and any other documentation, particularly around how you reference the different pieces of legislation, how you're doing the processing um, and so forth. So, so those are the key four areas of, of consideration. And, uh, you know, if you're sat here thinking, well, I'm a UK business, I don't process data um, outside of the UK and I only deal with UK citizens, then there's very little that you need to worry about it's when you're processing data on EU citizens, either because you target them or because you act on behalf of EU companies and process their data for them. Um, or if you're processing data outside the EEA, then you've, of course, got to bear in mind these GDPR restricted transfers. And those will be essentially the same in UK GDPR as they, in EU, as they will are currently in EU GDPR. So what should you be doing now? Well, the key thing is keep an eye out for any ICO guidance, any guidance or, or hints from the EU about what they're telling the member states to do post transition. Um, what the UK government might say, usually the best way is to see what the ICO say. They tend to publish statements or even publish guidance uh, or tell the government what, what the position is. So probably the ICO, European Data Protection Board is another area to, to keep your eye on as well. So um, over the next four months or so, um, I would imagine that we'll get a steady flow of, of updates as and when they happen, but we need to be mindful that that might not happen until towards the end of the transition period. So it might be a mad rush at the end of this year to, to tidy up some things. However, there's a possibility you, your customers might be coming to you already and starting saying to you, we need you to sign standard contract clauses regarding what happens with the Brexit transition. Um, and so you need to be prepared for that. Um, so step one, keep up to date with what's going on. Step two, um, work out, get a plan in place, decide how you're going to address this issue, whether you're going to leave it to the last minute, whether you're going to work with your clients or whether you're already being forced to work with your clients that are bringing this into question. Um, you, and um, the key thing for you to do really right now is make sure you know where in the world your data is being processed and identify which ones are going to be uh, impacted by these changes, particularly if there's an, a, a no deal Brexit from a GDPR perspective. Um, you shouldn't find that too difficult because the accountability requirement to have a documentary evidence of um, what data you have should also record where in the world that data is being processed. So that should be relatively straightforward. Um, review your documents and your policies and make sure that um, they are up to date and, and reflect a, a potential change in, in the way forward. If you're relying on data protection impact assessments for your processing activity and those DPIA make reference to uh, any controls or checks and balances you have in place regarding international data flows, then you'll need to review those as well. Be clear on who's going to be the lead authority for the citizens' data. So if you've got customers in France, Germany and Spain, then you need to bear in mind that um, you may be answerable to their regulation um, accordingly um, as a uh, non-EEA uh, processor. Um, if necessary, you need to work out how you're going to appoint an, an EU representative. Um, and uh, oh, just a quick note, actually, a side note um, I mentioned, mentioned, meant to mention earlier. Um, there is also a potential that there will be a need for UK representatives, so organisations outside of the European Economic Area who want to process and target UK citizens. So um, there's a, it shouldn't impact on you because you, you won't be needing one of those, but um, just so you know that the government are talking about um, a US company, for example, targeting the UK will, um, and EU customers will not only need an EU representative, 
or to be domiciled in the EU, but they will also need either to be domiciled in, in the UK or have a UK representative. But the step seven there, determine if you need an EU representative basically um, and who you're going to use. Um, and that will typically be somebody operating in the member states where you have most of your customers um, when they're in the, uh, the EU member states. Um, I've just got a question come through, but I'll just finish this um, and then I'll come back to it. Um, determine where you might need to use standard contract clauses and expect some engagement from your EU customers. So as I said before, you can expect people to start talking to you about this um, if they need to. Um, they may try and push you into signing standard contract clauses. So that's step two of deciding on what you're going to do, how you're going to act, needs to also include a plan about how you deal with people trying to get you to sign up to new contracts, which include the standard contract clauses. Um, and that's really, um, that's step nine as well, is being prepared for how you deal with that. Um, and um, as always with data protection and GDPR, document as much as you possibly can in terms of your approach and your decisions, particularly if they're a bit borderline as to what you should or shouldn't be doing because that documentary evidence is a, a great way of um, proving your um, GDPR compliance and your approach to it. Um, okay, uh, so I've got a question. If you have an office and process in a country with an EU adequacy decision, will that require an EU representative? Uh, no, if you're, if you're processing, say you're processing your data in New Zealand, EU has an agreement that New Zealand's data protection law is equivalent to GDPR um, and therefore you can process your data in New Zealand and the UK government have indicated that if the EU say it's okay then it will be okay from a UK perspective as well so um, so that's one way of looking at it now if you have um, if you have an office in New Zealand do you need an EU representative um, so if, you're, if, you're, if the question is, if we have, a, a just picking New Zealand as a random example, because uh, they have an adequacy decision, if you're in New Zealand targeting EU citizens, you will still need to apply the GDPR and I think you will also need an EU representative. And the problem is if you're in the UK and New Zealand and the New Zealand office targets the EU and the UK deals with UK only, you having an office in the UK won't count because um, UK will be outside the EU. Um, yes, yeah, so it will only work if you have an office in the EU, whether, regardless of where you may be working from. So if you're in a, a New Zealand company, but you've also got an office in, in France, then um, you don't need a representative because the French arm of your business will be the, the, the will be responsible. Um, so I hope that answers that question. Okay, so that was all I wanted to cover. Um, obviously, there's some complexities here in trying to work out what, what you do or don't need and what that might or might not look like. Um, as I said at the beginning, I provide support services um, to businesses. Um, I can certainly help you with this, whether that's working out whether the standard contract clauses are, are, are right and, and correct or whether you should be applying them or not whether you're being put under pressure to, to sign things. Um, but um, yeah, I can pretty much help you with any aspect of that. And in fact, I've worked with businesses uh, on and off over the last couple of years since we had the various Brexit, Brexit periods of where we were or weren't going to, to leave with or without a no deal. And, and certainly some businesses were finding they were being pressured and they were also being pressured by non-EEA um, organizations as, as well um, with regards to all of this, <coughs> excuse me. Um, but yes, if you if you need some help, then uh, please do do get in touch. Um, if you found this webinar useful and helpful, um, then um, just to fill you in on on a few other things, I've got a um, a present a webinar that's free next week um, on the sixth of August, looking at uh, the GDPR implications for the new normal, and specifically looking at what this means for um, the fact that we we've sort of had to panic in terms of getting things in place because all of a sudden we're not allowed out and we have to get our businesses working remotely and, and all these kind of things to actually moving more towards a transition of a, um, a so-called new normal where you can't rely on the fact that you did your best. You've got to make sure it's all, all in, in order. You might be using Zoom and 
you've got employees working from home, you might be testing employees. So there's a, a free webinar where I'll be covering all of those things on the 6th. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the Shems 2 case, that's the thing that's basically poo-pooed um, uh, the privacy shield, making it invalid, and also brings into question whether standard contract clauses with US businesses um, is appropriate or not, then um, I run a, a monthly meetup for data, data protection practitioners. It's an online thing done through Zoom. Um, and we will be talking about Shrems 2, and that's on, on Tuesday. So again, that's free to join. Um, and then from the 7th of August, which is next Friday, um, I'm beginning a restart of my 10-week GDPR workout where I look at um, the various different elements of uh, GDPR compliance in, in a lot of detail, so much more than, than you would get from a, a, a free webinar that I run, although the first one of those 10 is a refresh of GDPR and is actually free. Um, so yeah, take a look at that. And if there's anything there that you're interested in, feel free to sign up. If the dates don't work, then um, sign up. And just like this one, uh, this, this webinar, um, I'll be sending around recording. So if you want to get the recording, then, uh, um, then uh, sign up anyway. Um, but uh, that's, that's the end of the presentation. We've got about 10 minutes um, in which to, to take any questions. I think I've answered all the questions that came through through chat. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop the screen share and I'm going to stop the recording um, and then if 